Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, last week Pastor Derek got us started in our Thoughts and Prayers sermon series looking at the question of does God hear our prayers? And what I loved about last week's message was not just the answer to the question that yes, God does answer prayer, but also that encouragement that when we go to our God in prayer, rather than constantly speaking, uh, to be the ones who listen to God first before we speak into that prayer. That was a changer for me in terms of my prayer life and, and kind of how I go about doing that. So it was a great opportunity to dive into that. And so for this week, we're actually looking at the question of, does prayer change things? And you know, this is kind of a, a loaded question because this question often gets asked when things have gone wrong. Right? No one's sitting there in the prime of their life and the good parts of their life going, hmm, I'd like to change this. This is too good, right? Like nobody does that. Nobody wants to see things change when things are going really well. It's usually when things have gone south that this question comes into play. I know for me, I, I began thinking about this just a couple of weeks ago uh, with the incident in Kansas City that took place during the Chiefs Super Bowl parade. You know, it was a day where there was supposed to be joy, right? It was a celebration. The Chiefs won the Super Bowl. It was an opportunity for the town to gather together to just celebrate that truth, to, to make some good memories, to have some good fun. And instead, that day took a turn for the worse. And it became a, another day of tragedy, a, another day of loss, another day of senseless violence, and yet another day with words and words and more words. In fact, I don't even think it took an hour after the incident took place for celebrities and commentators and news anchors to, to chime in asking and pleading with our politicians to do something about this, right? To do something about these kinds of tragedies happening over and over and over again, that they, that they need to step in, that they need to do something so that they stop happening, so that they never happen again. And I get it. You know, I understand why that seems to be our, our first reaction when these things come, uh, happen, to, to go to our politicians, to go to our political figures. I mean, after all, we already gave God a try, didn't we? I mean, the last time this happened, and the time before that, and the time before that, and the time before that, we tried God, right? We, we went before him with our hashtags, uh, we went before him with our, our tears, our sadness. We even went before him with our anger and seemingly nothing changed. It all stayed the same. In fact, it may have even gotten worse because it just keeps happening over and over and over again. And so God had his chance, didn't he? To, to bring some change into the midst of volatile situations, to, to make those things come to an end and yet nothing has seemed to change. And so does prayer really change things, if that's the case? Well, you know, as we look at our text for today, from James chapter 5, he seems pretty adamant that prayer does actually change things, especially when prayer is offered in those times of tragedy, in those times of of senseless violence. Because that's the backdrop in which James is writing this portion of the text. You see, there are Jewish Christians who are fleeing for their lives. They became recent converts to Christianity, becoming followers of Jesus Christ and their family members, their friends. They wanted nothing to do with it, and they no longer wanted nothing to do with them. Right? They wanted absolutely nothing to do with them, and so they would beat them, they would leave them for dead. They would rob them blind because they became followers of Jesus Christ. In other words, they were suffering persecution to the point where they would have to flee their hometowns. They would have to leave to try to find another place to live. That is what they were experiencing. Those moments of tragedy, those moments of, of senseless violence in that persecution. And it's with that persecution in mind that James writes this text. Particularly in our selected text for today, it's with that in mind that he asks these three distinct questions. Look to the screen. Is anyone among you suffering? Is anyone cheerful? Is anyone among you weary? 
Now, the first question is like asking if water is wet, right? Like in the midst of persecution, is anyone suffering? Yes, right? There's not another answer to that one. Absolutely. People are suffering in that way. And the second question has more of a Philippians 4 mindset, that thought process of not necessarily being happy that you're being persecuted, but that you are to give thanks in all circumstances. And then finally, that third question, you may have noticed a little change from the text. We put the word weary in there instead of sick. Because when you look at that word in the Greek, it has two possible definitions, sick and weary. But you know, when you look at the entire New Testament, it's only used one other time than this text, and that's in Hebrews 12, 3, where the inspired author encourages us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus so that we do not grow weary and lose heart as we run our race, so that we don't get so exhausted that we stop running the race altogether. So in other words, for that third question, James is asking, basically, are you exhausted physically, uh, mentally, um, emotionally, to the point where you can't even pray or even think about praying? These are the questions that come in the midst of persecution. And it's in these questions that we have the same answer over and over and over again. Is anyone among you suffering? All right, then pray. Pray. Is anyone cheerful? Pray. Is anyone among you weary? Pray. And even if you can't pray, don't let that stop you. Find somebody else to pray for you. Why? Because prayer changes things. Now admittedly, as we go on in James chapter 5 and even into the history of the early church, we see that the persecution didn't stop. It actually expanded to include all Christians, and it got a whole lot worse for everyone involved. And that, again, seems to fly in the face of the truth that that prayer changes things because it should get better. It shouldn't get worse. At the very least, it sounds depressingly familiar that we, we pray for an end to violence, and yet it continues to increase. Uh, We pray for an end to the the tragedies of this life, and yet they still continue to happen. Again, it just seems to fly in the face that prayer changes things. And yet, as James continues, he's very clear that prayer does change things and even gets specific as to what it changes. Look to the screen. He says, And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick or weary, and the Lord will raise him up, And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So in other words, prayer changes three things. You see them there on the screen. People will be restored. People will be raised up, strengthened. And people will be forgiven. Those are the changes that prayer brings into our lives. And I get it, there there seems to be a disconnect there, right? We're we're praying for an end of violence, an end of tragedy, and yet these are the things that are actually changing. So why does that matter? How does that make sense? Well, look at it from this way. You know, when those tragedies happen, when those senseless acts of violence take place, how do you feel? How, How do you respond when you see them unfolding before your very eyes, whether it's Kansas City or Burnsville, Minnesota? How do you respond? I know for me, my heart just breaks. It just shatters into a million pieces watching those things unfold, reading the stories that came from those events those days. I also know that there's a sense of hopelessness that comes over me, a numbness as if this is just the way it is now. This is just the way it's going to be. I got to tell you, I also feel angry and even a sense of hatred for those who have caused these tragedies, for those who have brought about these senseless acts of violence to continue happening in the lives of so many people. So how about for you? When you see them happening, when you watch them unfold before your very eyes, how do you feel? Do you feel that heartbreak? Do you feel that that hopelessness, that numbness start to creep in? Do you even feel that that anger 
or, or that hatred start coming into your life. Those are real feelings, aren't they? Real emotions that come from those experiences, from watching those events unfold. And you know they're not unique to us. Those are the same feelings, the same emotions that the people in James's day were experiencing. They experienced that same heartbreak as they watched tragedy unfold before their very eyes. They experienced the same anger and hatred. They experienced the same hopelessness and even numbness in their lives as they watched that senseless violence occur in their very lives. But you know what it did? It made them pray more. Because they knew that they couldn't stay in those places. They knew it wasn't good to stay in the heartbreak. They knew it wasn't good to stay in the the hopelessness and the numbness. They knew it wasn't good to stay in the anger and the hatred. And the same is true for you and me. It's not good to stay there. It's not good for us to stay in that heartbreak, in that hopelessness, numbness, in that anger, and in that hatred. Which is why when we pray, God brings about these changes into our lives so that we don't stay there, but rather experience His power, His work at work in our lives and in the lives of so many others. Dear friends, I I know that when these tragedies come, when these senseless acts of violence happen in our communities and in our world, there is this thought that somehow God may not have been there or, or maybe that he was busy doing something else. But he was there. He is there. He always will be there, doing the work of his kingdom, bringing that kingdom into the midst of those tragedies, into the midst of those violent acts. And by constantly going back to him in prayer, we can remember that. We can see that. Because if we stay in heartbreak, in in hopelessness, in numbness, in anger or hatred, that all leads back to one place being pulled further and further away from him. But constantly going back to him in prayer, it reminds us, it shows us that that he is constantly at work in those times, in those places, in all times, in all places. That in the midst of heartbreak, he is bringing his restoration. That no matter how many pieces your heart might be broken into, your God in Christ is working to put every piece back together. That in the midst of the hopelessness and numbness, Christ is bringing his resurrection power so that there is hope, so that there is a sense of life that flourishes among you. So that in the midst of anger and hatred, there is forgiveness so that you don't run your race with with weights around your ankles, but rather can run the race freely, unencumbered by the, the sin of this world. That is what happens when we go to our God in prayer. That is the change that we can expect to experience as we continually go back to him in those times and in so many others. And I get it. It may not be the change we're exactly praying for. You know, we may be praying for that end to tragedy, that end to senseless violence, and yet this is what we're getting. This is the change we're seeing. But you know, this is where the change needs to start if the other things are going to change in our world. Because real and lasting change doesn't come from anger or hatred. Real and lasting change doesn't come from hopelessness or numbness. Real and lasting change does not come from heartbreak. Rather, it comes through Christ's restoration, through Christ's resurrection, 
through Christ's forgiveness at work in our lives, changing us so that we can bring change into the many places we go in our lives. And so the challenge that I've got for you this week is to talk with somebody in your life and to ask them to pray for a change in your life that you want to see, specifically a change that might be holding you back from making real and lasting change in your life or in the life of somebody else. Or or even going to somebody else and just asking them, what change do they want to see? What change needs to be made in their life? And offering to pray for them for that change. But whatever it might be, my hope and prayer is that you just never stop praying. Because through it, you will see the truth. That it actually does change things. And most importantly, it changes you and it changes me to remember and see who our God is, was, and always will be. God's blessings to you as you continue to pray. God's blessings to you as you experience that truth in your life. Amen. Amen.